We're really d delighted to, to have Charlie Savage with us this evening. He's written a, a, a really important book. Um, the book seeks to, seeks to answer what, uh, for many people who, who follow national security affairs, has been a rather vexing question uh, about the Obama administration, namely, uh, how, how did it happen that Barack Obama and his top aides who came into office promising different approaches to uh, fighting terrorism uh, than the ones pursued by the Bush administration. Um, why is it that they ended up in a number of cases actually continuing or expanding uh, George Bush's policies? Uh, in general, Obama's policies have seemed to satisfy almost no one. Uh, on the one hand, he has deeply disappointed defenders of, of civil liberties uh, on the left who had expected him to to close Guantanamo, stop the, the drone uh, uh, strikes, and, and end warrantless surveillance. On the other, uh, he still comes under repeated attack by hawks on the right for, for failing to be tough enough. Uh, Charlie is an exceptionally well-positioned journalist to, to tell this story and to sort through the, the complicated uh, legal issues, uh, having focused his reporting for more than a decade on presidential power and national security uh, legal policy matters. Uh, he got his start in journalism with the Miami Herald as a local government and politics reporter. But by 2003, he had joined the Boston Globe and was covering uh, national legal affairs. In 2007, he won a Pulitzer for his reporting on uh, presidential signing statements. Uh, and he also finished a book that year, his first entitled Takeover, which was about the, the growth of executive power. In 2008, he joined the New York Times, uh, where he remains today. Uh, now, there have been other books, of course, uh, on various aspects of the Obama administration's efforts to combat terrorism. But Charlie's book, which is titled Power Wars, uh, is the most comprehensive and revealing account so far of how the policies on drones, detentions, uh, leak prosecutions, surveillance, and other aspects came to be. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Charlie Savage. Well, good evening. Can everyone hear me okay? Thank you so much for coming out. It's really flattering. I haven't done a bookstore event yet. This is my first one. Uh, the book obviously just went on sale uh, on November 3rd, and I've been in New York until this morning doing these sort of crazy things where you go on MSNBC and you wait there for an hour and then they ask you two things and you get off the set again. And this is really not the kind of book that you can talk about in a soundbite very easily. Uh, so I'm looking forward to just talking and talking. No, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, but I do want to talk, say a few things about the book and then um, we can go have questions as well. And typically in these events I've found, including with my first book, it's the question and answer, which is more spontaneous, that's the sort of best part of the evening, so I want to leave some time for that. Well, but I want to take you back right now to January of 2009. Uh, Barack Obama is sworn in as president, and he keeps saying things like, we, the Bush administration has presented this false choice between our ideals and our security, and we don't, we're not going to make that sacrifice anymore. We're going to live up to our values. And the first things he does is he promises more transparency, and he issues executive orders, closing the CIA black site prisons, banning torture, closing, ordering Guantanamo closed within a year. And he does all this in the first two or three days as of uh, in power. And I remember in that period turning to a colleague of mine, Scott Shane, who also covers similar sort of counterterrorism issues. And we were saying to each other, what are we going to do with ourselves? Because for the last you know, number of years, we had been specializing in torture and surveillance and drones and Guantanamo and CIA black sites and renditions and surveillance. And this is what we did for a living. And this is what we our sources were. And this is what we thought about. And this was our contribution. And it really looked like we needed to find uh, a new line of work or at least something else, you know, go cover the environment or the Chicago Cubs. Um, uh, but very quickly, uh, it became apparent that there was still some work to be done in chronicling and uncovering and trying to figure out uh, the post-9-11 policies of the new administration. Already by February of 2009, it had crystallized for me 
that there was going to be much greater continuity between the late-term Bush policies on counterterrorism and the Obama policies than the expectations that had been created by his campaign rhetoric. As his new team was coming in and, and going through confirmation hearings for CIA director or attorney general and so forth, uh, over and over they were saying in their confirmation hearings, well, we agree that indefinite detention without trial is actually lawful as a tool for counterterrorism purposes. We are going to close Guantanamo, but we don't think that we have to repudiate this tool. Or we think that we will continue uh, to have the CIA render prisoners uh, to third party countries for the purpose of interrogation, just getting a diplomatic assurances that they won't be abused, which was exactly the same policy, at least on paper, that the Bush administration had. And although Obama turned off military commissions, he did so in a way that made clear that he could turn them back on again. And that is, of course, exactly what he did um, a few months later. And in court, they went in and uh, there was a, some existing lawsuits that they had inherited about surveillance and torture uh, that the Bush administration had tried to get thrown out of court without an actual look at the evidence by asserting the state secrets privilege. And Obama had criticized this kind of use of the state secrets privilege to get rid of uh, entire uh, lawsuits uh, without any kind of adjudication on the merits. But it, they went into court and the Justice Department w said to the judge, we're going to keep asserting the state secrets privilege in this case. We actually think it's justified after all. And so all these little tidbits were starting to line up, and it said, to, which suggested to me, where's the change? Uh, that this is not going to be as sweeping as we thought. And I went, I called up the White House, and I said, I'm going to write an article about how these policies seem to be lining up with greater continuity than expected. And they invited me in to talk to Greg Craig, who was Obama's new. Uh, White House counsel at the time, and he made no, really no apologies for this. Uh, this is still February of 2009. He said, "We're not. This is. We are not going to, you know, shoot from the hip and have bumper sticker slogans and just, you know, turn everything off on a dime. We're going to be very careful. We're going to be very deliberate. We're going to think about it. We're going to talk about it. We're going to have a lot of process before we dislodge the status quo." And and I wrote an article about that, and that was sort of the first sign that something uh, was going to be different than expected. And I remember. Uh, Glenn Greenwald, later famous for uh, being one of Ed Edward Snowden's uh, leak recipients, wrote an article criticizing me for being too harsh on Obama uh, from his vantage point on the civil liberties perspective. And of course, no one is harsher on Obama than Glenn Greenwald now on a civil liberties perspective. Um, so I went on to continue to write about these issues. I kept going down to Guantanamo. Uh, and I. Uh, eventually started to teach a class here in town at Georgetown uh, University to in their political science department. I co-taught it, I should say. I had a, my colleague was a, the just retired general counsel from the Senate Intelligence Committee who had worked for Senator Rockefeller and then Senator Feinstein. And we, we taught it for two, two years, uh, national security and the Constitution. And that class forced me to think about this stuff from a 10,000 foot perspective. Because I know it, I live it every day, and I'm in the weeds, and I'm, what's the incremental development today? But if you're going to teach it to juniors and seniors in college, or in some cases graduate students, you have to stop and say, well, what are the 10 things you need to know about surveillance to understand the recurring frictions that, and the, that keep coming up? What are the 10 things you need to know about what's in play on interrogation, so that the next time some terrorist gets arrested, some terrorism suspect gets arrested, and on CNN they're arguing about whether that person should be read their Miranda rights or not. You understand what the background of that is. What is Miranda? How is applying that to a terrorism case or delaying when you tell someone that they have a right to remain silent or have a lawyer? Um, how is it different when it's national security instead of some ordinary you know, bank robber? And how, have, how has this been a dispute that has a history? So that when people start shouting on TV and issuing their press releases, you know where they're coming from. You know what the background is. You know what bills have been proposed or uh, what the last fight was and how it was resolved. And towards the end of that, uh, working on that class and sort of designing lesson plans and readings and learning how to explain it to people, um, Edward Snowden then dumps out his documents on surveillance. This is now June of 2013. And it becomes clear that Obama has kept a very expansive surveillance state really untouched from the one he had inherited from George W. Bush. And at that point, it was just totally clear I needed to, I needed to write this book, basically. Because li little newspaper articles that say this is what happened yesterday in NSA land, or this is what hap what's going to happen tomorrow in Guantanamo land, um, 
give you a snapshot, but they don't give you the structural whole. And this, and this larger question of like, what happened? How did we get here from the pre the senator, the the liberal, super liberal constitutional law professor or senator who was going to uh, change George W. Bush's global war on terror? to the president who had overseen the NSA surveillance state that Snowden was revealing, who despite his efforts to close Guantanamo had actually endorsed the idea that indefinite detention without trial somewhere else is lawful, uh, who continued to use military commissions, who was escalating the use of drone strikes, who was uh, uh, in presiding over more leak investigations of journalist sources than all previous presidents combined, and, and so forth. Uh, what had happened, you know, not out of any sort of insidiousness, but it was happening, and why was it happening, and what was happening behind the scenes that was driving that. So that was the purpose of the book, trying to answer that question to solve that, that mystery. And I spent two years on it. I, I spoke to uh, more than 150 Obama administration officials, current and former, and when I say that, I don't mean like I talked to them once. Many of them I talked to over and over and over again as I was researching this subject or that subject, cross-referencing accounts, cross-referencing memories, reconciling inconsistencies until I became satisfied that I uh, understood probably what the truth was about this fight or that dispute or this other thing that no one even knew about before, but turned out behind the scenes to have been very important. Uh, I came into, uh, into access to many, many documents that have not been public and still aren't public today. And from all of this, I've tried to stitch it together in a, in a way that my students at Georgetown, who are very smart people but are not lawyers, uh, could find accessible and, and engaging. And that's the, that's the book I've tried to write. And so there's a lot of behind the scenes stories in this book, what you'll find. It's a, there's a lot of sort of, you're the fly on the wall in the situation room. Something terrible is happening in the world. It's raised this dilemma. The Obama administration officials now have to figure out what to do. And a lot of the figuring out what to do, especially in this administration, has to do with figuring out what the legally available options are. And the reason for that is that this administration, way more than the Bush administration for sure, but than many administrations, is an exceedingly lawyer-centric administration. Everything they do, the way they're trained to think, the way they talk to each other is legalized. The reason for that is they're all lawyers. Obama is a lawyer. Biden is a lawyer. The people they're putting into policy-making roles around them are lawyers. Think about George W. Bush and Dick Cheney are CEOs by background, right? They're not lawyers. And George W. Bush's secret secretaries of state were Colin Powell and Condi Rice, not lawyers. Obama's secretaries of state are Hillary Clinton and John Kerry, lawyers. And that rep, his national security advisor, Tom Donilon, the most inf influential one at least, was a lawyer. Several of his chiefs of staff, it goes on and on down into the bureaucracy. And this has consequences. They care about the law. Uh, they are trained to think like lawyers. They focus on the law. And when you think about how lawyers are trained to think, this has certain consequences. So lawyers are trained to think uh, in law school and then in practice uh, very incrementally. They value robust adherence to process. Uh, they really have to grapple with the other side that's not what they want to do but what the other side wants to do because they have to be able to go into court and rebut it and anticipate the strongest arguments about what they're doing. And so whether even when the, the issue before them was not a legal one, uh, that had consequences for the sort of deliberative, the deliberative style of the Obama administration. It, you know, people ca uh, caricaturized the Bush administration as sort of government by cowboy, right? They were reckless, they shot from the hip, they got into Iraq without really thinking through the consequences of uh, what could go wrong, arguably. Uh, but on the other hand, they could move, right? Bush was the decider. He got things done. He figured out what he was trying to do. He didn't second guess himself, and he could push thing policy changes through government for better and worse. Uh, the Obama administration, no one accuses them of that, right? What they accuse the Obama administration of uh, is, is dithering, of, be of indecision, of paralysis. They don't, what are we gonna do about the, are we gonna arm the Syrian rebels or not? You know, months pass, they keep just having more meetings because they see what can go wrong and they see, they're trapped in the ambivalence. And that's sort of, you know, every function, every system has its own dysfunction. There's the, and that's the dysfunction of government by lawyer. But it also has its upsides, which is a very careful, very deliberative, very methodical approach to analyzing the problem in front of them. But th and that's just in terms of what's the best policy. What's the best legal theory then, is, which is, is particularly interesting? And the reason for that is, as, as I told my students at Georgetown, 
the uh, the law of national security in the post 9/11 world, the 21st century, is in great flux. So many of the situations that we're encountering right now uh, are situations for which the rules are unclear. The rules were not written with this in mind. The rules for surveillance were written for analog circuit-based telephones, not for the internet, which works totally differently. And people, it's being applied to it. Is it being applied correctly? Is it being applied by the sort of analogy? It almost becomes literary criticism after a while, rather than uh, a legal process. The rules for war are written for 20th century conflicts between nation state armies wearing uniforms meeting on a literal battlefield. They are not written for a armed conflict against a non-state nation act, a non-nation state actor, transnational network that doesn't wear uniforms, that goes all around the world, that doesn't have a really clear command and control system, that doesn't have a leader necessarily that can say, okay, we surrender, and everyone all the way down the chain says, okay, we're going to stop fighting, right? A, a, a band of zealots for which surrender is not possible, and that flows into ungoverned spaces that are neither normal countries that have police forces that can go suppress a threat, nor a place where we have troops on the ground engaged in sustained combat, places like rural Yemen, Somalia, uh, tribal Pakistan, now unfortunately Libya and parts of Syria. Uh, so how do the laws of war apply to that situation? In the, the Bush administration, which was exceedingly unlawyerly, it's not a lot of lawyers in policy making roles and the lawyers they did surround themselves with tended to have very aggressive theories of executive power under which the president when acting as commander in chief can essentially do whatever he thinks is necessary to protect national security whatever a federal statute or a treaty might stay and that theory uh, basically means there's no real reason to engage with the law because the law is always irrelevant if you're acting as commander in chief the Obama administration, the opposite extreme, they're exceedingly interested in the law. They're, they're trained to think about uh, things through a legal lens. They want to know what the legal justification is, what the legal arguments are. And they want to portray themselves, both in their own minds and to the world at large, as waging this war within a framework of law. But everything is so ambiguous and so fuzzy that there's multiple interpretations often about what could what the rules might be and then these so pressures arise right to pick the interpretation that might be the most expedient one rather than the one that might be the best one when the when there's not a black and white answer and so what one of the things i kept asking uh the all these obama officials as i went around was you know if the bush administration was going to write a two-page memo that says commander in chief we're done what's for lunch we can do x and the Obama administration spends months and they write a 200 page memo that agonizes over all the permutations and has all the footnotes. But at the end of the day, they still say we can do X. Does that make a difference? Is what, what is, what's, this in, in, what's the difference with that? And uh, I, you know, some people would say there is no difference. It's just you know, a bunch of legalistic nonsense. Uh, I got pushback from that notion, though. The, the part of what they, the answer was, well, it, sometimes it does make a difference because, in fact, the lawyers do say no occasionally, and I found some examples of that, not many, but some, uh, which you'll find in the book. But also their argument was, which is a, a very lawyerly argument, the process is substance in itself because the law, even if law is not dictating the outcome, uh, law is uh, shaping and disciplining the conversation. Law is bringing issues to the fore. And in some ways, that pushes us towards a direction where we're not trying to do something that the lawyers would say no to at the end of the day. And so when they're deliberating about what to do about the discovery that Osama bin Laden is living in this compound in Abbottabad, for example, one option is to bomb it to smithereens and in such a way that if there's any tunnels underneath, they would be destroyed too. The problem with that is that's going to kill dozens, perhaps hundreds of innocent people in the neighborhood in which this compound is embedded. Now, in war, uh, you can kill civilians. You can kill innocent st bystanders. That's one of the, the harsh rules of war, and that's one of the reasons human rights people are uh, don't accept the notion that this is a real war. The Obama administration does accept the notion that it's a real war. So in a war, you can you can you can kill bystanders as long as it's necessary and proportionate to the military objective. And the lawyers were prepared to sign off on quite a lot of civilian deaths to get bin Laden, because obviously getting bin Laden in the 9-11 war would be a huge military objective. But just the fact of discussing this and trying to work through, well, how much civilian bystanders' uh, deaths are justified, how much would be too much, they never really got to the point where they had to say yes or no, because it focused the conversation on 
this was going to be a bloody bombing. And Obama decides, we're not going to do that. We're going to do something else. We'll either do a drone strike or we'll do a raid. And so it pushes it away from a place where the lawyers had to do something extreme, but the law still had an influence on how that played out. Another way that this, another sort of insight that arises from all the sort of insider stories uh, that I uncovered for this book is that they don't uh, accept the notion that, as, as sort of ACLU types would contend, uh, Obama is acting like Bush when he does things like use drones or have this warrantless surveillance program continue or use military commissions and so forth. Uh, and in hindsight, it's easier to see now than it was uh, during the Bush years that among Bush's critics, mostly Democrats but also some libertarians on the right, uh, there are two very different strands of criticism or of, of objection to what Bush and Cheney put in place following 9-11. There was a civil liberties critique and a rule of law critique. The civil liberties critique said these policies are inherently wrong. The state should not have the authority to do this vis-a-vis -vis the individual. Right? The, the, the state should not have the power to wiretap without going to a judge and showing probable cause. The state should not have the power to put someone on trial in a military court without all the rights of a normal court. The rule of law critique says this agnostic about whether these are the right policies maybe with the exception of torture, which is always wrong. But the rule of law critique says, well, even if these are necessary because of the new problems of Al Qaeda and 21st century terrorism, you've got to do it the right way. If the law says you can't do this thing, you don't just blow through the law. You, say, you go to Congress and you get the statute changed. The president doesn't have the power under the Constitution to break the law, even though he is the commander in chief. That's the rule of law critique. So during the sort of middle years of the Bush administration, these two critiques were entangled because they were working together. And you would go to conferences or panel discussions, and this person would make this kind of critique, and the person sitting next to him would make that kind of critique. And it all just sort of blended together in a, in a way that it wasn't clear that it was actually things that were operating on very different levels. But they do operate on very different levels because this one is fixable. Congress can pass a Military Commissions Act that changes federal law to say, yes, we are going to have military commissions. Congress can pass a FISA Amendments Act that says instead of, uh, instead of a warrantless surveillance program being illegal, it's now affirmatively authorized by law. And by the end of the Bush administration, Congress, in fact, had intervened a great deal. And, in, in the, and we later found out secretly the FISA court had intervened as well, coming up with some sort of secret legal interpretations to grant blessing to programs and put them on a firmer legal footing, at least uh, in, formally, uh, than they were when Bush first put them into place. And the Obama administration, the very lawyerly legalized um, president and his uh, advisors that he gathered around him, tended to see the problem with Bush as being a rule of law critique problem. And when you go back and you look carefully at what all these people were saying before they were members of the Obama administration, when they're just, you know, random aid to Senator so-and-so or whatnot, uh, and you can find the old transcripts, overwhelmingly they're the people saying the president can't do this, not the president shouldn't do this. And so they think the problem is fixed and they can move on one story, uh, and then I'll stop soon, that illustrates this quite vividly, I think, uh, is the story of the briefing that President Obama received in uh, February 4, I think it was, 2009. So he's been president for about two weeks at this point. And he's going to get a briefing in the Situation Room from members of the permanent security state that stay on from one administration to the next, you know, the, the uh, FBI, the Defense Department, the NSA, the CIA, about all the surveillance programs that he has inherited that he doesn't know about yet. Of course, he knows about the warrantless wiretapping program because uh, my future colleagues at the New York Times had exposed it. But there's all this other stuff he doesn't know about that we know about now because of the Snowden leaks, including that uh, you know, every time an American uh, sent an email or dialed a phone call, the government was keeping, collecting and keeping a record of that communication. Um, and so he sits in there and, and uh, he comes in that he's late. It's like a weird day for him. Dick Cheney's been attacking him already, which is sort of breaking with protocol that the old guys usually don't uh, say anything about the new guys for a while. 
later that day he's got to go talk to some family members of the of victims of 9-11 and the coal bombing who are pissed because he's turned off the military commission and they wanted justice and what's happening he come and he, so he comes in he's chomping nicotine gum he's so stressed out and he's thinking about dick cheney attacking him and 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 this this meeting he has to have later and these the the top lawyer for the intelligence community briefs him on all these programs. He said, this is what you've got. And by the way, these programs are critical to protecting national security and preventing an attack, the kind of attack that uh, the family members he's about to meet suffered from, the kind of attack that Dick Cheney's uh, saying is going to happen because he's taking away CIA black sites and so forth. This is critical to stopping that. By the way, also, it's legal. It was put in place without legal authority under George W. Bush, but now the, the Congress knows about it. Now the Intelligence Surveillance Court has, is issuing uh, orders and overseeing it. It's normalized, and we think it's really important. There's some problems with it. We're fixing those problems, and it's all good. And Obama says, I'm comfortable with what you're telling me, but I want my lawyers to take a look. And he points to Greg Craig. That's the new White House counsel I mentioned that I came in and talked to a couple weeks after that. And he points to Eric Holder, who just got sworn in a couple days before that. And so they're supposed to go just make sure that it's okay. And they're also fine with it. And I, I talk to them, and so it, it goes on, basically, right? That's, that's the point where he decides this is, this is not a fight he's going to pick with the surveillance state. He's cool with it. And then four years later, the Snowden leaks happened, and then he has to grapple with whether he's going to reform it or defend it or what. Uh, you know, most of the people I talked to for this book, I talked to uh, on background. And most of it stayed on background. So you have to sort of trust me that I'm not being misled. And you know, you should always take it with a grain of salt when you don't know what the sourcing is. Uh, but I did talk on the record to Greg Craig about that meeting and why it was he uh, thought it was OK. And he said to me, well, he was a former federal defender. And Eric Holder is a former prosecutor. They're used to cases in which there's uh, pin registers involved. That's a device that the police put on to log a suspect's phone calls who they're in communication with, not what's said, but just who they're contacting. They know that in 1979, the Supreme Court had ruled that the Fourth Amendment does not apply to that kind of a communication. So there's the constitutional issues have been settled long ago. That case involved one person's calls for a couple days, not everyone in the country's calls for five years. But the reasoning, but no, the, it's not a joke, because the reasoning behind it didn't turn on how much. It was just it, once you expose who you're talking to to someone else, you don't have a privacy right over it anymore. Because and when you expose it to the phone company, uh, you don't. That means you don't have an expectation that no one's going to know that you did that. So that's true for all of us, not just the criminal suspect. So they th they thought the, the the constitutional issues had been settled long ago. It was really important now that the intelligence court had gotten involved and there was legal process, and this did not seem to be a rogue program. Uh, and so it was just important to make sure that it was fixed so that it lived up to the rules. The intelligence court had set for it, you know, and and so that's what happened. And that explanation, of course, is a rule of law explanation. That's the lawyer's way of the, of looking at. Here's this radical program. What might be the problem with it? Well, the problem might be that it's illegal or unconstitutional. No, it's not. Okay, we're satisfied. And of course, once Edward Snowden reveals that program in June 2013, there's an eruption. There's an eruption on the left and the right across the board. They, uh, of people who don't really care that the intelligence court has said it's OK. They don't really care that there is a clever interpretation of the Patriot Act that putatively uh, makes it uh, something that can be done. They don't really care that the intelligence committees know about it. They don't want it to happen, right? They think it's un-American for the government to be keeping a track of everyone's phone calls. And that's just not a question that was asked, because it's a lawyerly administration, and they thought that the rule of law critique was the one to bring to bear on these hard questions. Um, so my, and my last sort of anecdote, and then we'll go to questions, uh, is the regarding a, a sort of very different issue, one that's not just about post 9-11, but is about national security and presidential power in general, and that is war power. Obviously, my title is a slightly a, a pun on the idea of war power. Uh, power wars, in this case, though, also meaning the struggle over what the power should be and how much power the president has. One of those is when can the president start a war without getting permission from Congress? Uh, in 2007, when I was still at the Boston Globe, I conducted a survey of uh, people who wanted to be president. I had just written that first book about George W. Bush and Cheney and their expansion of the presidential power. And I was, it was this same moment that we're in right now, eight years later. Uh, you know, debates were happening on TV. 
and the debates sucked from my point of view because they weren't asking any of the questions about presidential power and surveillance and military commissions and Guantanamo, the stuff that I at least was passionately interested in. Uh, the debate moderators just seemed incapable of focusing on that. And eventually my wife, who's in the audience here, said, after hearing me complain one time too many, said, why don't you ask them if you think that someone should ask them? And I was fortunate at that point to work for the Boston Globe, which has a moment of tremendous influence in presidential politics, which is right before the New Hampshire primary. It's the most important paper for the New Hampshire primary. And so, I, and so you have this moment of leverage where people care about the Boston Globe and pay attention to it. Uh, and, and that was when I put out the survey. And they, I got great responses from both parties, including from future President Barack Obama. And, and one of my questions had been, when does the president have the authority to bomb another country without going to Congress absent an imminent threat to the US? And he had a very law professor answer. He said, the Constitution does not give the president the authority to bomb another country without going to Congress absent an imminent threat, period. Then flash forward to 2011. Uh, th th there's a, the Arab Spring happens, there's a rebellion in Libya against Gaddafi, and uh, the United Nations Security Council has authorized a no-fly zone use of force to protect the civilians in the, in the city of Benghazi, whose Gaddafi's forces are sweeping towards, and he's threatening to basically kill them all. And at that moment, Congress is a mess. That's the first moment where Congress really starts to show it, the mess that it's been in ever since. This is post uh, where it's in sort of in where the Republican Party is in control of things but divided against itself. So the, the Tea Party midterm has happened and the, the sort of very conservative faction in the House that doesn't want to raise the debt ceiling or keep the government open unless uh, the Obamacare is reversed and so forth are preventing action. And there's been a series of very short bills in which uh, Speaker Boehner has had to rely on Democratic votes to keep the government open for like another week and another week. And it's incredibly bitter and it's exhausting and all the members are leaving town already uh, just at the moment when the UN says, okay, we, as a matter of international law, we, you guys can go protect Benghazi. And Obama is faced then with a dilemma. He can stick with his old principle as articulated in that survey and do nothing and allow Gaddafi, to, Gaddafi to, to slaughter all these civilians. Or because Congress has not affirmatively voted to give him the authority to intervene. Or he can violate that principle and he can you know, inter launch a no-fly zone, which NATO can't really do without us, and, and save these people. And sort of sotto, sotto voice, the uh, leaders of the Republican Party at least are saying, yeah, okay. And uh, 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 there's a, the signal seems to be, do it. Just do it. Just do it. And, and there had been a resolution in the Senate sort of supporting the idea of a no-fly zone, but there hadn't been an authorization. So he does intervene, and he violates that principle, uh, and, but he you know, saves Benghazi. Of course, Libya becomes a mess anyway. It's, it's more of a slow-motion humanitarian disaster. But that's, that gave, and the people in Congress complain about it, but really nothing happens. And I think and that's the pivotal moment for me in the book in tracing out his evolution towards being more and more willing to act unilaterally as the, as the uh, foil shifts from being Bush and Cheney and their expansive view on executive power, and he wasn't going to be like them, to the foil being the quote-unquote obstructionist Republican Congress, and he was going to get things done notwithstanding you know, their dysfunction in his eyes. And he kind of learns that if he just acts, they'll complain, but they won't really do anything, or he can litigate, and he can still get things done. And that becomes more and more aggressive, especially in domestic policy um, in the years that followed. But in flash forward again to 2013, and now it's in Syria, he has said to Assad's forces, if you use chemical weapons, that's a red line for me, I'm going to get you. And they do use chemical weapons, and the whole world thinks he's about to bomb Assad. Uh, for as, as punishment for this norm, when it, surprising everyone except his own lawyers who'd advised him to do this, he stops and says, I'm going to go to Congress this time. And I had this scene where he's, you know, he takes this 50 minute walk in the Rose Garden with Dennis McDonough, who's now his chief of staff, and he comes back and he gathers his aides and he says, We've got to get away from Congress just not being involved in this stuff. We have to force them to. And by the way, remember what I said in 2007 to the Boston Globe. I agree with that guy. I agree with the guy who said that. So you see him sort of waffling or, or struggling even within himself between these sort of pragmatic demands of the actual responsibility of the office versus the abstract ideals of how the law is supposed to work. And it eventually, of course, that crisis is resolved. The final chapter of it is in 2014. 
uh, he's, when the Islamic State kind of sweeps out of Syria and starts uh, taking over swaths of Iraq. And he's going to bomb them to first protect some people on a mountain and then more generally. And he's faced with the, the, the question, do I say that this is a war, in which case I got to go to Congress. But once again, I, the Congress does not seem to be capable of actually passing anything that I ask for. Or do I do nothing because they're, they're paralyzed, therefore the United States is paralyzed? Or do I come up with, and then the lawyers say, well, we have a theory. You, the theory can be the Islamic State is kind of like Al Qaeda. And so you can just say that their existing authority from 14 years ago to go after the perpetrators of 9-11, you can use that for a war now in Syria and Iraq against the Islamic State. And that theory, and that's what he does. And that theory gets greatly criticized, uh, but it is a theory that allows him to s at least say, I'm acting with congressional authorization. I'm not going to have the same issues I had with Libya. And I'm the United States is still going to try to you know, do something to, the, to stop this very bad thing that's happening in Syria. Uh, these are the sorts of dilemmas that they faced all the time. And this lens of what is our authority, what are the rules, what are we going to, how are we going to publicly justify this, is how they, is the, is the sort of uh, disciplining lens they brought to all these, these conversations. And so when you read this book, if you, I, as I hope you do, and I'm so glad to see such a good turnout tonight, uh, I hope that part of the takeaway you get from it is just how fascinatingly interesting this period of time is. With all the rules in flux, with the stakes so very high, um, even people who are on the same team and share the same ideology in general can't even agree with each other most of the time about what the rules should be. But we're obviously in the transitional moment. We're moving towards what America is going to be like in the 21st century. And uh, this book hopefully is a record and an explainer of how we got here and where we might be going. So thank you very much. I'm, I was meant to re supposed to remind you all to please go to the microphone if you have a question. So some of you have already lined up. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I uh, didn't read your book yet, and I hope there is an answer to the question which, which our host asked. Why did it happen? What you said basically was that this was the conflict between legalistic mentality and pragmatic decisions. But it doesn't explain the fact that you know, basically, let's face it, the Middle Eastern policy of President Obama was a disaster, is a disaster, and there are lots of contradictions in itself which cannot be explained, at least uh, based on what I've heard from you, just by this conflict be be between legalistic mentality and the practical approach. Uh, would, you, would you presume, I mean, this is my probably suggestion, my theory, but that President Obama and his team in the first place did not have a plan, at least on what concerns the Middle East. When, they, when President, you did mention the Cairo speech, which was sort of kumbaya speech, yep. where everybody was supposed to be happy and uh, live in peace forever after that, and it didn't happen, actually. But w my question is, now <laughs> comes my question, wouldn't be the uh, misinterpretation of Arab Spring as the follow up to the Cairo speech deterred Obama's administration from take, taking appropriate measures earlier, sooner than later. Thank you. S sure. So uh, to, to, I think, if, stop me if I'm wrong, but I think I, the, the essential question is the Middle East is a mess. Obama's policies clearly haven't worked there. Is this, is this stuff that we're talking about sufficient to explain all of that? And an answer, the first step is, no, this is not sufficient to explain all of that. Because a lot of this has to do with the United States and how we govern ourselves and what we do here and, uh, uh, and we're what rights we give people and what security measures we take when terrorists come into custody and so forth. And that is a sort of separate dimension to what do you do about the Middle East. Uh, the, the more depressing fact, which it doesn't quite stem from this, but my own observation is there may not be a right answer in the Middle East. You know, Tony Blair, I think, recently pointed out that th we've tried, <laughs> we being the West, uh, a major land occupation and nation building exercise with Iraq, which didn't work. And we tried an air war that didn't put troops on the ground, which would be Libya, and that didn't work. And tried doing nothing, and that'd be Syria, and that didn't work. It's just sort of like, it's a disaster that uh, is sui generis 
And this, this sort of stuff over on our side of the world um, may be inadequate to unpacking that puzzle. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, under Obama. Oh, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. I'll come back to you. When you said um, the, after the February 4th, uh, 2009 meeting, um, Obama said, uh, you know, he heard from the civil servants, and then he said, I'll run this past Greg Craig and um, Eric the Omer. Attorney General. Mm -hmm. um, a report came out last week that the Attorney General wasn't apprised of uh, the raid on um, the uh, bin Laden. Bin Laden. That was my report. Until until uh, <laughs> a day before. Uh, could you explain why it was different in that situation? And give us more background on, on, on how they decided on doing it the way they did? So, yeah, that was, uh, that was an article in the New York Times that I wrote that's derived from four subchapters of the targeted killing chapter in this book. The sort of legal dimension to what are they going to do about Osama bin Laden and the discovery that he's probably living in this strange compound in Abbottabad. Um, th you know, that's been a much scrutinized raid. There's been already two books written about it. There's the sort of crazy conspiracy theory mix that Seymour Hersh added to it, which is wrong. And the, the, but it, here's this whole piece of it that had not been examined. And so that's my contribution to, um, to the puzzle. Uh, yes, so the, 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 the story is basically the CIA finds this place. The first lawyer to know is Stephen Preston, who's the CIA's general counsel. Pretty soon they tell Obama and the White House, and the second lawyer to know is the National Security Council legal advisor, Mary DeRosa. This is all about September 2010. And for the next six months, they are the only two lawyers who know. And one of the reasons they're the only two lawyers is there's not much law to be done yet. The policymakers are focused on getting more intelligence about this strange compound, who's living there, what else can they find out about it, does the Pakistani government know about it, or is it not? And, but by the spring of 2011, uh, the focus has shifted to courses of action. That's why I mentioned earlier, should, should they bomb it and so forth. These legal issues, these operational issues arise which have legal overtones, and so the lawyers start to get involved. And fairly soon, around late March, they allow the, 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 the decision maker here is Tom Donilon, the national security advisor um, uh, to President Obama at the time. And he allows, he's holding this super, super close because if it gets out that we've found him, he'll be gone. And the, the one in ten, once every 10 years opportunity to catch him and get rid of him will be lost, and that would be a disaster. Uh, and so he's trying to keep this secret as tightly held as possible. Only people who need to know in his eyes are told. Eventually, he permits the top two lawyers in the military, the uniformed uh, advisor to the Joint Chiefs and the civilian uh, general counsel to the, to, to the Def Department of Defense are also allowed to know. And those four lawyers are the only lawyers at the policymaking level. They work through all these issues about violating Pakistani sovereignty, burying an enemy at sea, even though the Geneva Conventions say you have to bury enemies in marked graves. Uh, is, can, it be, can the president order a kill operation? Yes, he can order a kill operation because this is war, but they have to take his surrender if the guy does surrender, and it's feasible to take him. And even to a week out before the, that's right, and they've been criticized for this, this very thing you're bringing up. They usually, and you, you'll see throughout this book, there's sort of an elite council of lawyers. It's those four I just mentioned, plus the State Department legal advisor, plus the head of the Office of Legal Counsel in the Justice Department. Those six lawyers are the interagency lawyers group. Everything that this administration did in the national security realm, pretty much except this, was filtered through that group. And they had tremendous influence. But they never tell OLC, and they never tell the State Department legal advisor. And even a week out, they haven't told the attorney general, the, the, now, the top law enforcement official in the land. He's only told, along with Bob Mueller, the day before the raid, long after the legal issues are resolved. Uh, and the justification, as best as I can tell, seems to just be, well, what was he going to do? This is an over what, was he, what did he have to contribute? This is an overseas uh, raid in a military operation, and what does that have to do with the Justice Department? Nevertheless, huge process foul. Extraordinary, especially for this administration that prized rigorous adherence to process to not uh, at least have him in the room and tell him. The Bush administration got slammed for doing things like not sometimes without telling John Ashcraft what was going on. This moment, uh, at least in that respect, uh, looks similar. Yes, sir. Uh, under the Obama administration, there's been a prosecution of record numbers of whistleblowers, more than twice as many as the Bush administration. There's been an erosion of uh, consumer rights, a compromise of the regulatory process. And I think there was a, a story in the paper just the other day about 
scientists at the USDA who, who claim that they cannot present legitimate research if it impairs, if it, if it intrudes with the interests of industry. I wonder if you could comment about that. Well, I'll take the first part. I, I, uh, you mentioned the prosecution of what you call whistleblowers. Uh, this administration has prosecuted nine people for authori unauthorized disclosures of information to the press for public education purposes. I, wouldn't, I would quarrel with calling them all whistleblowers, but clearly some of them were, and others were still just saying, letting people know about interesting, important things, even if it wasn't waste, fraud, and abuse. Uh, the reason that number, nine criminal leak prosecutions, is so extraordinary is not just the Bush administration, three in American history, from George Washington to George W. Bush. So we've gone from three in American history to nine over six years. Um, you know, that's, that's amazing. And uh, I, so I have a whole chapter just trying to figure that out. Lots of behind the scenes stuff on those cases and sort of where it came from. When something happens that's a sea change like that, we really want it to be happen for a reason. We don't, may not like that reason, but to make the world make sense, we want to someone to have said, let's crack down on leaks. And I went down uh, for a long time looking for the meeting where Obama or Eric Holder said, go get me some heads on spikes. There's too much leaking. And I couldn't find it. And I talked to lots of people, and if it had happened, someone would have told me. The re and I think that what the real solution is, the real answer is, which is more disturbing, actually, at the end of the day, is that technology has changed everything. And this, this, this cross-references with Ed Snowden and the revelation about metadata. Today, we are leaving record electronic trails of who we are in contact with and where we're going inevitably. We just can't not do that. And so it's very easy now for the FBI to figure out who was the leaker in a way that that was not true 10 or 15 years ago. 10 or 15 years ago, the CIA opens the New York Times and they see some secret and they make a criminal referral, and the FBI says, well, okay, great, who, kn who knew this secret? That's the first step to investigating it. And the CIA says, well, this list of 1,000 people, right? And the FBI closes the folder and says, thank you very much, right? Today, the FBI says, okay, of those 1,000 people, who, which of them have ever sent or received an email from the reporter who wrote the story? Who, which of them has ever sent or received a phone call, not just in the last week, but ever from the reporter that wrote the story on their work account? Uh, who, in other words, which of them has a social contact and is both in a position to be the leaker socially and in terms of access to the information? And suddenly that list of a thousand names might become six names or ten names. And you can investigate six or ten people. And you can, uh, you can send FBI agents to go talk to those guys. And then maybe they uh, deny ever having talked to the reporter because they're panicking and now you've got them on uh, misleading the FBI, which is a five-year offense in and of itself. And then you can get them to plead guilty to do it for one year. And suddenly, cases are viable in a way that were not before. What's disturbing about that is it's not something Obama did. It's not something Bush did. It's not something that President Rubio or President Trump or President Clinton, Hillary Clinton, can turn off. It's just the way it is. And I think it's going to have significant consequences for investigative journalism that we're still only starting to grapple with. Uh, yes, chapter eight. Chapter eight. Uh, yes, sir. That's right. Um, I want to say, um, I, I mean, I find this whole uh, discussion to be rather troubling, to be honest with you, uh, from a few standpoints. Um, you uh, started out saying that um, the Obama administration had rules of law problem with the with the Bush administration, right? Yes. And they wanted to fund. They wanted to base their decision making on rules. Uh, as you go on, seemingly, uh, there's no other way to put it. The rules and the law become increasingly irrelevant, increasingly malleable, or twistable, or turnable, whichever direction you want to make them do. I mean, you even claim, said, and you know, it is well known that uh, you know, if, 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 if they have a problem with a certain law to do a certain action, you just go to Congress and turn it over, right? Uh, have it overturned. Well, that's okay. Congress can change the law. That's how the system works. Yes, but that's a huge problem. Okay, if law becomes. Well, what's the question? If, Let's if law becomes question. so easily changeable, it becomes irrelevant. Uh, your the, question so the, first, what? The, the first question would be that um, is this whole. Um, 
issue of the Obama administration becoming kind of more national security state oriented. Mm -hmm. Do you see that lying in the transition of the Democratic Party in the 1980s to, you know, much more um, pro-defense, uh, you know, against crime, et cetera, et cetera. Do you see that as, as, as one potential? And the, the, the second question would be, is the, the problem of these laws. If you can change them so quickly, and if you can uh, kind of brainstorm what the potential problems may be with the law, then, as I say, you, you basically disarm the law going forward. You, 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 you claim that you're running the, uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the operation by the law, but basically you're undercutting the law. Is, isn't this a great problem? All right, so I don't think the second one, if, if what you're talking about is Congress changes the law to authorize something, doesn't that mean law is, is meaningless? No, because Congress did it. We have a system in which Congress can change the law. That's the point of, of representative democracy. So I'm not troubled by that. The first question, uh, is this a, a sign of uh, the sort of turn to, towards more centrism of the Democratic Party in the 80s or the 90s, the sort of Clinton triangulation. I, I think that everything is different post 9-11. Like, the, that's ancient history. Uh, to me, the Obama administration's turn towards, eventually towards greater hawkishness, which I, I peg really, uh, well, it had, came in with this sort of initial practice, you know, pragmatic mindset, we're not gonna be ideologues, but uh, I opened the book with the Christmas 2009 underwear bombing, which, you know, only through luck does the bomb not go off and kill 300 people over Detroit in Ob on Obama's first Christmas as president. The fallout from that is immense. Uh, among other things, in Massachusetts, a Republican, Scott Brown, wins the Ted Kennedy seat, uh, and the, suddenly the Democrats don't have their 60-vote majority in a supermajority filibuster proof in the Senate anymore. And the fact that a Republican could win in Massachusetts of all places uh, is just stunning to them. The polling data shows that it was the terrorism issue and reading Miranda rights to this terrorist that got Brown more traction than anything else. They see before them, one year after the historic sweeping victories of Obama, that he could be a failed one-term president, that everything they want to do, not just in national security and sort of right-sizing the Bush war on terrorism, but on health care reform and the rest, uh, could just be totally destroyed if there was an attack and that actually succeeded on his watch. And if at that point, the voices of reform inside the administration recede and the voices of, we better be careful about releasing this guy from Gitmo, or we better be careful about getting rid of that power, um, become much stronger. And th so I think that that's a moment uh, that has nothing to do with the 80s, but it, it sort of was a, a gut check for this administration. How much time do we have left? We have about five minutes. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you for an excellent presentation, and I look forward to reading your book. Thank you. Uh, you twice mentioned Edward Snowden. I wonder if you could bring us up to date on where that is right now, the damage done, whether he's viewed as a, uh, a traitor, a whistleblower, a hero. How does this administration looking at this uh, individual? This administration does not like that individual. Uh, he caused them untold, untold headaches. That, I mean, is that the question, though? I mean, how, the real question is how do we, the American public, view this individual, and I think that's a much more complicated uh, set of circumstances. I mean, I, I would be a total hypocrite to call him a traitor, but I, you, you'll find in this uh, book, chapter five is a history of surveillance from 1978, basically, until <coughs> 2009. It opens with that scene of that briefing I mentioned where Obama finds this stuff out. That's not a history that could have been written two years ago. Uh, we now, there's been this whole secret history behind the scenes in the United States of technology developing and government spying powers expanding and, and leveraging this technology and laws being reinterpreted secretly without anyone knowing that uh, to permit things that we didn't know was happening. Uh, that goes way, even before 9-11, goes way back into the 80s. Uh, in the arrival of fiber optic lines and the early internet and how the government was responding to the fact that large amounts of the world's communications were passing over our soil suddenly. Uh, that's a big part of our history. In, uh, now it can be told. What I did was I tried to take all this information that he leaked, but also that the government declassified in response to his leaks or in response to Freedom of Information Act lawsuits, many of which I filed, uh, to but it's all sort of out there in piecemeal form. And I tried to bring it together into a coherent story, a narrative, with some new uh, reporting to fill in the blanks so that at least people can now understand uh, what this dimension of our country has been for the last 30 years, uh, which had been completely hidden from us. 
Um, yes, sir. And then Margo. Yeah, I, 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 okay, I have a very simple question. If, if the Obama administration is so legalistic, how can you explain the fact that uh, Hillary Clinton had a private uh, mail server? I'm sorry, I couldn't make the, out. That she had a, Hillary Clinton has had a private mail server, email server? Hillary Clinton. So is, is this, this legal? She saw everything so, yeah, so the legalistic. Is, if, if, how do I reconcile Obama's legalistic mindset with the fact I that mean, Hillary the, the Clinton had a private mail server? You see, administration, don't say Obama, the administration is legalistic. Well, you know, I'm not actually, sh obviously having a private mail server was an inc in hindsight an incredibly stupid thing for her to do and uh, a hugely self-inflicted wound that she's still staggering from. I'm not actually sure that it was illegal and we'll see. Uh, Margo. Um, so thank you for your amazingly invaluable work. But so I have a question about your interpretation of why the Obama administration did took the approach that they did that isn't it doesn't what your work show is that in addition to the fact that they were lawyers and they were inclined in that way, is that the Bush administration had a different vision of our constitutional structure than the Obama administration lawyers, and that the Bush administration, which is what your book shows, which is that the Bush administration's vision is the commander in chief is not constrained by the law, and that the basic premise of the Obama lawyers is that the commander in chief is constrained by the law. And so we're talking not just about the difference between having lawyers or not having lawyers in your administration, right? But isn't it something much more fundamental? Well, I think it's all of the above. Yeah. Um, and of course, it, it slightly oversimplifies to think. I mean, I think that even the Obama people would say there are some things that are exclusively the president's to decide. It's just that circle of things is much smaller in their world although maybe it's getting bigger now than it was in 2009, but it's much smaller in the world than the, than the sort of David Addington, John Yu view, which was so sweeping that it made these other considerations almost irrelevant. Um, but I, I don't think it's a choice between one or the other. The, you know, there, it had these specifically legal dimensions that it mattered for why, is it worth arguing about these things and writing memos about these things? And it separately had this sort of cultural mindset about how you think about problems and, and what, you've, what you're focused on and what you bring to bear and whether you're a snap decider or a deliberative to a fault per kind of uh, But doesn't it have a constitutional theory at bottom and the two constitutional theories are different? Oh, sure. Yeah, that's all. Okay. <laughs> two more? No one's over there. Yes, ma'am. Um, I just like, uh, when you talk about this legalistic approach, I'd like to bring up the issue of those who uh, formulate, who passed the laws, uh, the Congress, uh, which I think has been uh, in many ways uh, very obstructionist, but kind of gets away with it. And um, for instance, Obama wanted to close Guantanamo. The Congress passed legislation, uh, in this case, uh, uh, restricting his power, saying he couldn't do it. Um, on the other hand, uh, when the Syria issue, he tried to actually go to the Congress and get uh, a declaration of war, and they punt refused to do anything. So um, how does that fit into your uh, views about the legalism uh, and the ways? Well, it, it, it ra so the problem is Congress is, it's hard to get Congress to act, and it's con hard to get Congress to affirmatively do something, especially uh, now that it's under Republican control and Obama asked them to do it, you know, for political reasons. Mm -hmm. He's already going to face an uphill climb, just as, you know, George W. Bush probably faced an uphill climb a lot when dealing with the purely Democratic Congress. Um, I think that you, part of what I map out in Chapter 12 is his evolution on executive power and executive unilateralism, uh, by which I mean, when he comes in, he seems to be very interested in working with Congress to set the rules for this or that or the other thing, and he was going to show how the Constitution meant for it to be done in our system of separation of powers, and that kind of runs into real politic, right, that, which is the, the, const the you know, 
things are so polarized right now that Congress uh, and the separation of power systems is not really working the way the founders intended it to. You know, the founders, we have this veneration for them, but they did not even think we were going to have political parties. They thought every member of Congress was going to be a, an independent actor thinking for himself or herself eventually. Uh, and there wouldn't be factions trying to control the government, working together across uh, chambers, across branches of government. And But of course, that is what we have, because that's human beings team up together to get things done or to prevent the other side from getting things done. And that's why parliamentary systems, in some ways, uh, work more smoothly <laughs> uh, in the modern world than our system. But this is the system we have. He, uh, and, and ob over time, Obama, as I mentioned before, the foil shifts from not being like Bush to trying to get things done and despite uh, the Republican Congress. And he becomes more and more aggressive in, say, sort of stretching his legal authorities or using ones that previously had been used this much, but now he's going to use that same power this much. And uh, he still has a year to go in office. And I think uh, I wrote an article a couple of days ago about Guantanamo and whether if Congress refuses to lift the restriction on bringing prisoners into the United States to be held here, whether in the end you know, he'll face a dilemma. He'll either have policy failure, and history will say he said he was going to close Gitmo and didn't, or he'll close it unilaterally in the in the teeth of a statute, which is sort of a George W. Bush type thing to do. And history will say he did that. Uh, and I'm not sure that either of those at options seems probably particularly attractive to him at this moment. But he's going to have to do one of them if Congress doesn't budge. So, so, uh, so you get well, the I'm situation sorry, I, I, I just where to go to I'm sorry, I was just going yeah. to say where he's accused of being weak and bizarre at the same time. Right. Last question. Yes, ma'am. Follow-up question on Edward Snowden. Um, what's going on? Obviously, the administration, as you said, is not happy. How are they going to um, bring him to justice in their eyes? Or what's going on with their... It seems totally frozen to me. He, Edward Snowden is living in Russia. Russia. Right now, right. Vladimir Putin is letting him live there. Um, as long as that remains, that remains. That could but remain if they a long time. Him, they could. Putin could trade him away for something tomorrow, right. and then he'd be screwed. Uh, he's living in a very precarious situation at the whim of a sort of, you know, not particularly nice person. So, but if they wanted to get him, they probably could. <coughs> they couldn't get him now. He's under. He's in Russia. Yeah. What were they going to? What are they going to do? But uh, but if Putin wants to expel him from Russia, or trade him for some other policy goal, uh, then suddenly he would be prosecuted. Yep. All right. Well, thank you all very much. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs>